I was doing what my parents told me to do. And I mean, I was obedient. I did everything that my parents said, even around the house with taking care of my siblings. And this was one extra thing. So initially, it didn't really register as something that was wrong. Welcome to the Father State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. Um, don't forget that the Father State is on subscribe. Doc. I mean, subscribestar.com. Subscribe Star. So click the link in the video subscription to support our work, and I do do appreciate it. I have with me Aziza Kabibi, and she is an author activist, and founder and CEO of a nonprofit, Precious Little Ladies, Inc. Um, Aziza, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jesse. Yeah. How are you? All is well. I um, a very interesting story you have here, and I really want to get into it. But first, happy White History Month. <laughs> Happy White History, but is it that most of the year? <laughs> <laughs> no, we all we only celebrated now in July. July is White History Month. Did you know that? I didn't. Oh yeah, July is Happy White History Month. Okay. Wow. <laughs> and when was that founded? Uh five years ago. This year is oh. the fifth year. Yeah. Who was it founded by? Uh this guy named Jesse Lee Peterson. I knew it was you. <laughs> 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 and so when you say White History Month, we celebrated most of the year, would you, you celebrated most of the year? No, not celebration of it, but I thought it just, pretty, especially in America, it, white history um, is celebrated all throughout the year. Oh, and what made you think that? Um, because of, well, first of all, America, the, as far as the United States, um, established, were established by, was established by white men, by, uh, a white culture. So most of the holidays that are celebrated throughout the year, I, I'm not well versed on who started all of the holidays. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's pretty safe to assume that they were started by the same culture or group or social group that founded the United States of America. Well, so. thank, thank you for that white history moment. At least you know the history. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, are you from, were you born here in America? Are you from here? Yes, I'm a Jersey girl. Oh, you're a Jersey girl. And yes. are you a Christian? No, I don't identify with specific religions. Oh, I see. And so you... I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I am. Um, no, I'm not a Christian as far as you know being baptized and the regular uh, religious practices of going to church on Sundays and living by the scripture. But my family, especially on my grandmother's side, is Christian Baptist, and I was exposed to the belief system. And um, I also define truths and guidance within the certain parts of the belief system. Right. And so do you believe in God? Yes. You do believe in God, but you just don't identify with a certain group or a certain type of religion. Right. I believe the truth can be found pretty much anywhere you look for it <laughs> or in a lot of different belief systems. So, you know, I, I feel like Christianity can be, Christianity and Catholicism can be kind of limiting in that respect, depending on which portion of it, whether you're Protestant or and Angela, I don't even know all the words. And, and right, Angelico. And, thank you, <laughs> Angelico. Like um, and huh. even those divisions, like there are so many divisions. I'm like, well, how do you choose which one is the correct one if yeah. there is a correct one? So, well, that's what happens when you start naming things. When you start naming it, you claim ownership to it, 
And once you claim ownership, it starts a mess. Because everybody want to own their own thing in order to yeah. feel good. Have you noticed that uh, men are under attack today? If men are under attack? Yeah, have you noticed um, that? I would say that because of the shift in um, the the shift of the public awareness of issues pertaining to women that yes, men have been a target in general and um, but in a lot of ways they brought it on themselves. So I just think, well, we're, we're turning the microscope towards men and the patriarchy because there has been a lot of negative issues in our society that was started by men. So yeah, I do think that there is a lot of attention on men and justly so. And, oh, you say it's justified to attack men? Um, I wouldn't call it an attack. Can a counter attack? Well, I guess it can be if it's a counter attack. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if if a man was to you know go to punch me in the face and I block it and punch it back, technically it's an attack. But it was an attack that was caused or incited by his action. So and you believe the same. And do you believe the same thing? If a woman should attack a man in, in the face, you should block it and attack and knock her out as well. Attack it as well. I I do. So I do believe that domestic violence goes both ways. Nice. I do think that. Um, intimate partner violence goes both ways. And, you know, whether it be a same sex relationship or a cisgender relationship, neither one is good. Whether it's the woman attacking the man or the man attacking a woman, it's not healthy. It's a toxic environment in general. So if a woman is attacking a man, should he attack her back? Um, yeah, he depends on the type of attack. So one thing that I have seen women do, I don't know if you've know, if you've seen it, they point a man in the head, yeah. you know, when they're being verbally abusive and confrontational, they'll point the man in the head. Is that deserving of the man knocking her out cold? Yes. I, I wouldn't say there's, there's, quality there because a man is physically stronger he's going to hurt a woman more than a woman could hurt her but I do think that you know if there is a way to resolve the conflict um by either disabling her or just leaving the situation I think that those should be explored first before just knocking her out now if she is coming at you with a knife <laughs> then, you know, you got to protect your life. <laughs> but shouldn't the woman know beforehand when she get ready to put her finger in a man's face like that and hit him on the forehead or whatever, should she know she run the risk of, uh, of getting knocked out? She should. So she, she should. shouldn't do it then because she knows she she's not know, stronger than a man. Right. No, she, should, she shouldn't do it. Nice. Do you love white people? Do I love white people? Yes. Um, hmm. It's an interesting question. I I love people for who they are. I do think that the 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 white population has contributed harm as well as good. Um, and I guess I interact with people more for their true selves, which is their soul, which has no race. So it really depends on the individual. As far as loving white people on a whole. Um, I, I feel I love them. I have no hate towards them. So I love them just as much as any other culture. And then of course, being a black woman, as far as my own culture, you know, they, they're a little bit higher <laughs> because <laughs> that is me <laughs> a little higher as far as the level of love. Um, so you love the black people more than you love the white people? I, I love my own. It's a different type of love. There's more of a protection love. There's more of a, you know, this is a part of me. It's like asking me, well, do I love my own children more than 
the next door neighbor's children. I'm going to give them the same amount of attention, especially if they are in need. But because my children are from me, there is an automatic, I think almost biological and definitely primal attachment to them. So as far as my people are concerned, I do definitely believe Black people need more attention. And do you love white people? <laughs> you ask me that again? <laughs> <laughs> In general, yes. I love white people. I love all people. So white, Indian, Chinese, Korean. Um, I love all people because I think all people have the potential to be as great as any other culture or race. Amazing. And so you have a very interesting story and let's start first with your nonprofit. Why did you start Precious Little Ladies? What is that all about? So Precious Little Ladies is a social progression organization that combats, combats child molestation, domestic violence, incestuous abuse, and sexual assault by strengthening the bond between mothers and daughters. And we focus on mothers and daughters specifically because within the family structure, within my family structure that I grew up in, um, my, my father molested me, he abused me, um, he forced me to have four children. I was impregnated five times by him. And my mother was in the home and, and knew about it the entire, well, she knew about it for most of the entire time. My father started molesting me when I was eight years old. She found out about it when I was 10. Um, and her position and her perspective on why it was happening, what role she felt that I played in it, I think demonstrated the fact that our bond as mother and daughter was weak. She did not have allegiance to me. She chose her husband over me. So I think it's important for women to really develop that bond between their daughters in order to help protect them. Now that does expand outside just the girls. It's also the boys as well, children in general. But to start with, we focus on that and then we expand our services to the entire family, male or female. Um, so yeah, that's why I started it. And that's pretty much what it does. We do the work through media, through social media, through activism. Um, we have programs, support programs, advocate programs that just help families to strengthen them and prepare them for the possibility of an incident of child abuse and also of domestic violence, and then support them if it is to happen, help them with resources, connect them to the right services, things like that. Were you surprised to learn how many mothers uh, having sex with their sons? I, I do a lot of counseling, and I've been okay. doing it now over the last 32 years, and I'm surprised at the number of men who were having sex with their mothers while growing up because you didn't hear you hear about the father, but you never hear anything about the mothers. And the mothers, were you surprised to know the amount of the number of mothers who are having sex with their sons? Well, I can't say that I was surprised because but believe it or not, the severity of my father's um, demented perspective of life, I could only assume, and, and being that he created a sense of normalcy within our family when it came to his demented perspectives of sex and a woman's role compared to a man's role, um, no, I wasn't surprised when I when I learned the statistics of men or boys and boys being abused by women. I actually recently did a video speaking about it. Now, as far as it being mothers to their sons, I mean, the issue is a power control because of the power dynamic. And then with boys, the way they are, our society and our culture looks at the sexual development as a, of a boy is different from how they look at the, the sexual development 
of a girl. So therefore there is less reporting of boys being abused or molested, whether it be by their mother or their aunt or their cousin or their sister. Um, so, and I'm aware of all of that. I'm aware of all of that through my studies, uh, through my work and my experiences. And yes, a lot of the clients that we speak to. So, yeah, know, I was, no. yeah, I always hear about men, especially lately, but nothing about, I mean, the fathers, but nothing about the mothers. So I was yeah. a little surprised that they don't, well, not surprised. I know why it is, but that they don't talk about the mothers. When you ask your mother, why didn't she do something about your father having sex with you as a child, period, what did she say? She said that she was afraid. Of she what? Said that she, was afraid. she was afraid of my father retaliating, um, afraid, afraid of him finding us because there was different points through my childhood and my young adulthood that I did ask her when I was very young, there was a time that I felt, and I mean, I know in my young mind, I probably did not consider everything that came along with escaping my father, but I felt that it was an opportunity for us to leave, for us to run away. And her response to me was that she doesn't have anything. My father was the breadwinner in the house. Um, he closely monitored everything that everybody did. So she felt like if she was to try to run away, one, she could not support all of the children that she had. She could not support How many herself. did she have? Uh, in total, my mom had nine children. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Your timing is interesting. <laughs> my family had not, my father, mother, well, my mother had nine children as well. Okay. So that's amazing. And you're my, number what? One. You're, you're the oldest. Okay. I'm the oldest. So am I. It's, uh, are you? Nice. So when you went to your father and asked him, why did you do that? What did he say? I've actually never asked him that. Why not? Not that I think about it. Uh, because he was drilling into my head why he was doing it to me on a regular basis. So I didn't need to ask that question. He told me everything from when I was really young and he first started molesting me that he was that this is what all fathers did. And he had to teach me how to be a woman. Uh, in my teenage years, when I did try to run away at different times, he told me this is the role that a woman plays with a man and him as the head of our household, he has the power to say and tell us everything that we're supposed to do. He said it was my purpose to be his sex slave. And he said it was my purpose to bring his pure blood inbred children into the world. So he always gave reasons. He said he was chosen by God. Um, so he always gave reasons and there was never a reason or a cause for me to actually ask him because he definitely provided the answer before I even could think about asking. And so as an adult, now that you're out there talking about it, have you gone to him and asked why as an adult so you can understand him better? Have you done that at all? I haven't yet. I do plan to, my intention is to go and visit him in prison uh, at some point to, yeah, essentially pick his brain to help bolster the work that I use and understand why abusers abuse. I don't know how much he's going to cooperate, but I would like to know, you know, at the position, the point that I am in my life and the level of healing that I have achieved to ask him from this space where I am now, well, what made you think that what she was doing is right? So... And so, um, do you love your father? And I don't mean like a sexual kind of love, but do you love your father? Um, I actually, I loved him a great deal. I loved him for a long time, even through the abuse. But at this point, no, I don't really. I have love for him as much as I would have for a complete stranger, just because of the fact that they are another human being living on, a, on this planet with the potential of contributing something to this world. And as God's creation, I love him that way. But as far as any kind of personal daughterly love, no, that was destroyed a while ago. So I'm not quite understanding. So mm -hmm. do you love him or not? You want a definitive black or what black and white answer. Um, I 
I would say, I'd have to say, yes, I do. But there are, there are um, a whole lot of conditions and explanations as to why. As to why you love him? Yes. And so your love come with condition? When it comes to him, yeah. And, and why? Why does you love him uh, con uh, conditionally? You love everybody else unconditionally, I assume, right? Um, I would say that I love everybody else unconditionally without knowing them. I do think that there are different <laughs> levels of love. I think that there are different levels of love and different types of love. Of course, like you defined not sexual love, right? right. But that you acknowledge that sexual love does exist. I do no, think that- No, but sexual love is not real. It's an illusion. But we'll get to that. I want to understand about you love your father conditionally, but you love other people unconditionally? It's not that I love my father conditionally. It's that the type of love that I have or I could display to him or express to him is conditional. Does that make sense? Uh, and give me an example of the conditional love you have for him. So I do think, again, as I said earlier, I have love for him as a human, right? As, as a a human on this planet as one of God's creations. But his actions and depending on one, if he's atoned for what he did, for what he's done to me and my sisters and um, taking my experience with him throughout my life and the pain that he has caused then creates levels or steps of the kind of love or loving energy that I would direct towards him. So I have love for him, again, as a human, but even to say, I'm going to take, I would take my positive energy. So when the day comes that I do talk to him, I'm not going there with hate. I'm not going with him, going there with disdain. I'm not going there with fear. I am going there with positive, loving energy in hopes that, if he was to take that or receive it, then it would help him heal, understand, or come to some kind of atoning resolution for the things that he's done. Have you, um, do you love God? Yes. And do you love God with conditions? No. Why not? Um, honestly, I have to say, it might just be built into me because I am a creation of the almighty. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it might just be automatically. Um, and I understand my understanding of, of this existence and of my creator is that, well, one, the fact that we have the freedom of choice, you know, any choices that anybody else has made that might have affected me negative, affected me negatively. Um, it's not like, I, I blame God for, right? I don't think that what God is, is something that's valuable. I think humans are valuable, but the almighty is not necessarily valuable, even though, you know, a space or an existence has been set up that allows humans to be valuable. So there's just no room for me not loving God. So it's, you it's love just, God. I don't even know what that, what that would feel mm -hmm. like or what that would look like. So you love God unconditionally. Yes. And have you ever done anything in life that you wish you had not done and said you would never do, but you did it again and you regret it? Uh, is there anything in my life that I wish I had never done? You either to someone else or something, and you couldn't believe you did it, but you did it anyway. Have you ever done that? No. You, so you haven't done nothing in your whole life so far that you c couldn't believe oh. you did it, but you did it again. One thing, one thing that I did do that I have to say that I really regretted, and I actually can feel um, how bad that I felt after I did it. So my brother, the, my, my, my brother who was born after me, he's the second oldest. Um, he's no longer with us, but 
when we were young, he and I was playing a game because I was homeschooled. I was left in the house at a, from a very young age by my parents to take care of my siblings, teach my siblings, entertain them for the amount of time that my parents wasn't home. So we were, I would concoct all of these games and we were playing a game. And during the game, he called me ugly. And for some reason, it hurt me so much when he said that, that I picked up a D-sized battery and threw it at his head and it hit him and he grew a cocoa and everything. And as soon as I saw the pain in his eyes and he was crying, I felt so bad. I felt so bad and I wished to heaven that I could have taken my actions back. Um, but anything else, you know, and like I said, I could, I feel that even now to this day, and even as into our adulthood, um, that would be the closest thing that I could say that I regretted doing. Have you ever been married? Yes. And so are you surprised at the way you, are you still married? No, I'm divorced. Are you surprised at the way you treated your ex-husband? Am I surprised at it? Yeah. I'm not surprised at how I treated my ex-husband. Are you no, proud of the way you treated him? Oh, I'm very proud of the so way So you're I proud that him. you were mean to him? I was, where'd you find that out from? Oh, a little birdie <laughs> told me so. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been mean to, to my husband as my ex or as my husband. <laughs> so you never gave your husband, your ex-husband hell? No. You were not <laughs> difficult. In fact, he wants me back. You, you were not difficult for him to deal with? No. So you were perfect in the way you dealt with him? I wouldn't say perfect. I don't think humans have the capabilities of being perfect. So but what's I, the one thing that you did with, that you regretted? When you look back on it, you can't believe you treated him in that way. I would say the one thing that I regret in our relationship is not noticing that the times he seemed to be occupied and wouldn't come home or was out a lot um, was because he was sleeping with my sister. And so you resented him for that? No, I didn't resent him. Well, what is the one thing you did wrong to him that you couldn't believe you did? There was nothing. I didn't do anything wrong to my ex-husband. So you husband. you were perfect in the way you dealt with him. I don't know if I was perfect. I for, okay from my perspective. Let's see. I would say the imperfect thing was probably that. No, I can't even say that. What do you think is perfect? I'm just asking you. You, so you say, you're saying so that with your ex- we're speaking from my definition of perfection. So we're speaking from my definition of perfection. So you're yours. saying with your ex-husband, you did nothing wrong. No, I didn't do you, anything wrong. You were patient. You obeyed him. Did you obey him? I did. I'm actually um, kind <laughs> of old-fashioned when it comes to relationships. So although he would, he would defer to me very often. He would defer to me very often. Um, actually most of the time, but, and I have to say, I don't know if he ever actually gave me a direct order to say, well, I obeyed him. We just, we worked, we Amazing. worked very well and I was very happy. So do you think that the things you, I noticed that it's hard for women to know what they did wrong. They can remember every detail from a hundred years, what a man did, but they can't remember anything they did wrong. Why is that? I can't speak for other women. I can't speak. I think people in general can be like that. But I women got more, it bad. Why is that? You think women have it bad? Yeah, I noticed that women, it, it, it was like they will destroy the husband, the children, the cat, the dog, the paint on the house before they admit where they are wrong. Do you mm -hmm. know why that is? I have heard that narrative. I've heard that narrative. Yeah. And um, one, I do believe that it changes based on race. Are you talking for white women as well? Or are you just saying that as it applies to black women? Well, I didn't, I didn't mention the color at all. I said women. Okay, so you just mean women of all cultures and ethnicities. Women. Why do you say 
okay, why do they not recognize what they could have done wrong in a relationship? Yeah, why is it hard for women to admit that they are wrong? But they can remember every detail about the man, right? Or about someone else, but with them, oh no, I was, I was just perfect. I didn't do anything. Why is it that women can't, don't know what they're doing, but they remember what everyone else does? Um, I don't know if women do that. I don't know. I have to just say that I don't know. Really? Uh, I know. Yeah, I know. I When I do something wrong, I hold myself accountable because I feel like that's the only way you could grow. You have to recognize what your flaws are in order to fix them. So I don't know any women that do that. Do, that, you, you, that, know, do you know other women? <laughs> now that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I know other women. I know other women professionally. I know other women, um, you know, of course I have clients that are other women, but as far as my circle, my circle is very tight knit and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in my interaction with women and it could just be when they talk to me. I mean, I tend to inspire people to be pretty open and honest and candid. And in my experience through my conversations, I have not, experienced women not taking responsibility for their actions now if they do that with their men i i don't know because i'm not there to witness it but when they're explaining things to me we will have an open conversation and they explore what they could have done wrong i think women actually blame themselves a lot so let's oh. just say go ahead let's so just let's say. just say your theory of why do women do that it could be a front. I theorize that it's a front, that internally we do blame ourselves a lot for things. And that's why even survivors of domestic violence, they have so much shame because they feel like they brought it on themselves. But openly to the public, you got to put up a strong front. Most women put up a strong front. So they may not even truly believe that they did nothing wrong, but they're not going <laughs> to let you know that. <laughs> um, um, so... Do you believe that God loves you unconditionally? I do. And so why don't you love your father unconditionally? Because my father is not God. My father is... But your father was created father. in the image of God. He is the son of God, even though he's been turned away from God. He's still the son of God. How that is, is it that you can love God, a whom you never see, but don't love your father, whom you have seen. But I do love my father, just not unconditionally. Well, unconditional conditional love is not love. Mm, I mean, I think that's up for debate. Like I said, there are different times of love to different types of love. There's only one real love, though. So tell me, explain to me what that is. It's the love when you love God with all your heart, soul, and might and you're mm -hmm. born of his spirit, you cannot help but love your brothers. And, I mean, your, your neighbor, right? And mm -hmm. it's impossible to love God, who you never see, and resent your earthly father, who you see. Because if you don't love your earthly father, there's no way back to God. If you don't love but the son, if you don't love the son, you can't love the father. Uh, I have to disagree with you with that because one, well, with a couple of things. One, I see God every day. I see God in the clouds. I see God in 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 the beauty that we have in this world. I see God in 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 the human desire and will to find a purpose for themselves, to help others uh, in their struggles. I see God everywhere on a regular daily basis. I see God when I close my eyes, when I meditate, when I pray. Um, so, and yes, I see God in my father as evil as I may think that he is, I do see God in him. And I, sometimes there is the question of, well, how do you contend with the conflict that is created by having one of God's creations have so much potential and do so many great things, but then they also do something so evil. They also do, can hurt people. Do you so, think God love you, your father, conditionally or unconditionally? I think God loves my father unconditionally, yes. And so I mean, he's, it, still, he's still alive. 
And so why don't you love him? If you're a daughter of God, why don't you love your father unconditionally then? Because my human experience, I'm still connected to the physical things that he has done to me. And um, maybe I've just not grown to the point where I can love him unconditionally. Have you forgiven am, him? Yes, I have. Then if you have truly forgiven him, how can there not be unconditional love? Why there should love should be only unconditional love, not conditional love. Because as forgive you forgive him, God forgive you. And so there's nothing left but love, unconditional love. I think forgiveness has more to do with love of self than it does have to do with love for the other person. Really? I think you that, love yeah, yourself? I, Yes, I do. And how, when you get I the love. I love myself unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. When you get the love that you love yourself with, where, where does that love come from? Um, the, where do I get the love that I love myself with? Huh. Well, you do know that as humans, we have something biologically built into us for self-preservation, right? So it's very difficult for um, us to cause pain to ourselves. Um, so I think biologically, just because to preserve this body, to preserve me, there is, of course, there's a certain level of self-love there. But as far as where I have gotten my sense of love in the truest form, which what I would say is more of a God love, I can appreciate my life's experiences and the things that they have taught me. Um, and I do think it's just a name. And as I think as being, knowing that I am here at the will of the almighty, it just gives me an unprecedented appreciation for myself. And so, so where and do you get the love from that you love yourself with? Where do I get it from? Yes. Where does, yeah, where does that love come from that you love yourself with? Um, I guess it comes from God. It's one of God's creations, then everything. If everything is created by God, then it would have to come from God, <laughs> right? <laughs> where does it come from for you? Oh, mess. <laughs> and so you believe you love yourself, but you don't know where you get that love from to love yourself. I've not, I've not fully discovered that yet. In fact, some people ask me that. Some people do ask me that. And I'm like, it just is. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, maybe I'll discover it one day, but I have not fully discovered, you know, what, why Aziza is how she is and why <laughs> I don't other than my conscious drive to to learn and grow and contribute and fulfill my purpose here I, I don't I can't tell you oh well if you make a left on Prospect Street and go up <laughs> forgiveness lane and dig a hole that's where Aziza's love come from <laughs> I can't tell you that. Amazing. So you mentioned earlier that you see God everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. You see him in the sky. You see him in the grass. You see him in the, everywhere. Do you see God in you? You didn't say if you saw him in you or not, do you? Well, yes, you, I do. You I see mean, God within you? So I feel like there are two forms of seeing, or at least two forms of seeing. There is, well, no, there's more than two forms of seeing, because if you're blind and you can't see, then some people see what they're hearing. Anyway, <laughs> um, there is the seeing as someone on the outside looking, right? I'm looking at you, so I see you on the screen here. And then there is an internal seeing, right? There's an internal sight that I think it's a little more difficult to access. So I would say that I see God in me. Um, it manifests on the outside through my actions and my impact and the work that I do. And that's how I see God in me, but through helping others. So you see God in you through helping others. 
yes. Really? I see it manifested, yes, on the and, outside. And so, by doing that. so what does he look like when you see him in the in the world? Like you say, you see him in the sky, you see him in the, everywhere. What does he look like out there? As the as I think God looks like the beauty that is manifested. So have you ever, um, have you ever experienced Stendhal syndrome? What? Stendhal, Stendhal syndrome. Stendhal Stand, syndrome. Stendhal is, syndrome? No, Stendhal. Oh, Stendhal. Okay. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> I wish I could spell it for you, but right now my brain isn't there. <laughs> um, Stendhal syndrome i really hope i'm saying it right but it's when someone sees something of such beauty that it makes them emotional right so i have looked up in the sky and i see the clouds and how amazing they are and how the fact that the earth and our experience here has this these mechanisms that work so perfectly and especially you want to know what also does that when you see a child being born, when you see a child being born, that's when you truly see like the miracle of not only childbirth, not only of this human existence, but uh, of God manifesting. However, you identify with God. What does so. he look like inside of you? When you see him in you, what does he look like? I, I noticed that you put emphasis on the word he, but God looks like I, I already told you looks like the work that I do the oh, happiness I, see. That I could bring to somebody so I'm also a chef so when I you also a what energy, a chef a chef oh yes, okay I'm also a chef. yeah so when I take my energy and I bake a cake or I, or I make food and I see you know my family or my clients enjoying and eating something that I made with a gift that God has given me then that's a manifestation of God also because it made them happy, it made them feel good, it nourished their bodies. So let me ask, um, you had five children for your father? Five, I was impregnated five times. Only four came to fruition. Oh, yeah. I just carried one. Oh, okay. And yeah. how old were you when you first had your first child for your father? I got pregnant at 15, and I had my first child at 16. And how old were you when you had your last child? I was 22. And why were you still having sex right. with him at 22? Because I didn't have a choice in the matter. At 22, you still had to have, were you still living at home or something? He was still in my life, controlling me, threatening me, beating me. Oh, beating I see. My, my sisters, my mom, yes. You know, and so how do you, how do your children feel knowing that you said, I saw one of your videos and you said that my children are my brothers and sisters. Because you have one they son, I believe. Yes, but biologically they are my siblings. What's that like? I mean, we have, we have the same father. Right. That's amazing. What that like, what is that like knowing that your children and how do they see the fact that they're your, they're, you're like their mother and you're their sister? What is, what do they say about that? Uh, they say a lot of different things. That I would say it's an interesting experience because there is a dynamic uh, as far as our our parental relate by parental by me being their parent and how the fact that I am also their sibling plays out. Uh, more, it's more on the positive side only because, and I'm not saying this is intentional because it's not necessarily intentional. I do think that the age that I had them and was raising them with, the fact that I was so young also created a relationship of more camaraderie, um, which then played into the fact that we were siblings. And then their experience in life was different from mine. They went to school, I didn't. So while they was going through the school system, it was a perspective for me that I learned from, even though I was their parent. So there was a lot of learning and growing. I wasn't necessarily in the position to be all authoritative over them because there was a lot about the world that I didn't know that they were being exposed to at a very young age. And for me, I was an adult. So I think that it is most shown 
just in our familiarity, how we interact with each other. I mean, my, my kids are my best friends, especially my oldest daughter. We enjoy a lot of the same things. They come to me about any and everything. So I think the comfortability between, I don't even know if that's a word, but our comfort levels uh, as, as parent and child is increased because of this dynamic that we are also siblings. When they as far- when they leave home to go to school, they're out into the world with their friends and other people. How are they dealing with the teasing and the attacks from other people that their father is their grandfather and their mother is their sister? How do they deal with the teasing of the world about those things? They don't. They don't experience that. No one says anything to them about it at all? They, no, their friends, their friends have only been supportive. They have never been teased for that at all. Do you, not that you, they thank are, God. say what now? I said, thank God, they've not been teased for that at all. But now that you have put all that, your business into the street like that, you've been telling everybody about it and you have kids and the kids will suffer from it. They, they at some point, the world going to turn on them. They're going to have to deal with that. Do you regret putting your stuff in the sh- out there like that rather than just working it out within yourself? Are you, still, Jesse, what? Are you, you still, <laughs> are you still proud that you put that out there and now they're going to have to suffer the consequence of it? So but the world is so mean and evil it now. And, and you, you see how bad, no love in the world. You see how bad things are. And people who love hell, love making, you know, trying to draw other people in their hell. Mm-hmm. Do you regret at, lo- at all putting your business out there like that, knowing that they're going to judge, the world is judging you too. And they're younger, so they're going to have to live with that and deal with it. Do you regret putting your business out in the streets like that? No. And why you not? Just want a straight answer, no. Because... At least for uh, them, why woman, don't you care? I'm sorry? At least knowing that they're going to have to deal with it because they're going to live long and the world's going to get worse before it gets better. Why don't you care that you have done that? Why don't I care? Yeah. I, no one said I, I didn't care. Of course I care. I mean, they're my children. I love them. So um, one, like you, like you mentioned, the, the world is can be very evil yeah. and very so before I put myself out there of course I considered my children and I had a conversation with them but I do think that because of their experience and their life with me through their childhood and through their adolescence um, they developed a sense of resilience a sense of internal resilience that I passed on to them and they're not afraid of a fight so if there's a matter of weighing the pros and the cons. If us being put out there can help other people, can help educate people, could help support other victims and survivors and could help put an end to the negativity in general to child molestation and domestic violence, however far into the future it will be, what we're doing does contribute to it ending. It is worth the ridicule that we as a family could get from the public. And I mean, thank God, and I am extremely grateful the fact that it has been minimal. It has been minimal. So I, I can't say, I've gotten some very mean things said to me. And I'm sure you have. And usually my daughter is the first person that is there to defend me and to help and put people in their place. But the rewards and the potential rewards and the and the positivity that it it encourages and incites is definitely worth the small sacrifice of and- being... In the good old and days, they, they feel the same way. They feel the same way. In the good old days, the uh, people knew not to put your private business in the street. They would tell you, "Don't put your business in the street because people are just going to judge you. They're going to use it against you because people are evil, right? Just like the same evil we all have to overcome is inside other people." And so we were taught not to do that. Go to God with your stuff, not to human beings. Because there's nothing another human being can do to help you with spiritual issues. Where did this idea come from that you're supposed to go out and put your business in the street 
because it doesn't help anyone at all. No one changed by hearing your business. They just feel good about being wrong themselves, but it doesn't change their hearts. It doesn't change their heart from anger to love. Where did this idea come from? And I see it a lot now. I see men doing it, and it's totally abnormal for men to do it. I can understand women doing it since they're the weak investor and they can't help themselves, right? But it's abnormal for men to put their personal business in the street. Where did this idea come from that men and women should go out and tell the world and pretend that they are helping somebody by telling the world? Where did that come from? Okay, so to answer your question clearly, um, there's a lot of words that you're using that I think I need to clarify, like <laughs> abnormal, right? What you're saying is abnormal. Uh, first, we would have to define what normal is. Normal so, is not putting your business in the street. Abnormal is putting your business in the street. I'm talking about the de definition. I'm talking about the definition of normal. So are you talking about normal as it pertains to what a group has agreed upon that is normal behavior? Because then it would be normal to put your business out on social media because everybody's doing it. That's a sense of normal. That's an abnormal now, state saying, though. You're saying that it's abnormal, but if the majority of people are doing it, then technically it's normal. But that's why you right? should know. That's why you should never follow the majority because the majority of people take the wide road that leads to destruction. Wow. Is that one man or woman that decide to stay on the street and narrow path, and and they are the ones that will live. The abnormal people are the weak people that take the crowd, follow the crowd. Would you agree to that? So the abnormal are people who follow the crowd. That's yes. the general purpose. So the abnormal is the status quo, but normal is what is unique and individual. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. That makes sense, so, right? Um, depends on the perspective that you are looking at it from. Are you a crowd taker or are you an individual? Or do I'm you, an individual. Or do you follow the crowd? It depends on what space that I'm in. What do you mean by that? So if I go to church, right, let's say I go to a Christian Baptist church and the crowd, there are 500 people there and all of the crowd are bowing their heads to pray. Out of, but let's just say at home, me as an individual, I don't bow my head. I bend my knees and hold my head straight up. Well, aren't you following the crowd by putting your business in the street rather than being an individual and working it out between you and God? Am I following the crowd? Well, why can't I do it all? I, I work it out between, I have worked it out between God and myself. But if you had worked so, it out for, between you and God, you would never put it in the street because it would exist no more. That's not true because then that would be a selfish act. If what I am only seeking, if I'm only seeking to heal myself, then that means that I am only focused on myself. You can't heal anyone care. else. You can't, you can't even heal yourself, and you can't heal anyone else. Only God can heal us when we see what's going on within us. So you're not healing anyone by putting your business in the street. It may feel good, and it may people say, oh, that's so nice. You so this, you so that. But nobody's being healed from you putting your business in the street. So I never said that I was healing anyone. Right. I never said that. I am helping people to facilitate their own healing. So as far as me actually healing, I'm not, you know, someone who lays hands on a person and say, you're healed. Um, that's not, but I could be a conduit and I could help facilitate somebody's healing that they either do on their own or do with a professional. If but it's putting your business in the street is not even facilitating to point a person back to God. Hey, let God handle this is facilitating. But to put your business out there because you're going to be judged. People, people talk about you right now. You might not, may, uh, and you say you hear from some of them. Oh, I'm sure they are. Yeah. yeah. So I'm you're sure not helping the situation at all. But let me ask because of time. Are that you over the trauma of what? <laughs> are you over the trauma of what happened to you with you and your father? Are you over that trauma? Yes. And how do you know you're over it? I know that I'm over it because I function 
quite efficiently on a daily basis, even though I have experienced that trauma. I have seen progress and I've experienced progress and, um, and growth from that trauma. I recognize and I know who I used to be and I have changed for the better from that place. So, so when you are by, go ahead, I'm sorry, finish that. No, I'm done. Go so when, you, when you're when you not in front of the cameras and you're not talking to the people and the public, you're, you're just by yourself, home alone, by yourself, nobody around, no phone. How do you deal with uh, this the, the loneliness or the fear or the doubt you experience when you're all alone, there's no distraction? How do you handle that? Loneliness, fear, and doubt. Oh, what, you know how you feel like, wow, I'm not that important. I thought I was important. And I'm using words here. When you're by yourself, how do you deal with being by yourself with no cameras, nobody around? How do you handle that? When um, all of a sudden you don't feel important or anything? Well, why not? I don't need to feel important. I don't I'm need saying when, you don't, when you're not getting ego gratification, what is it like for you to be alone? It's amazing. <laughs> In what way is it amazing? Uh, well, usually the quiet. I like the quiet. <laughs> I do like the quiet. I could tend to myself. I could, I, I could meditate. I could watch a good movie or a good TV show. I could write. I could create. I mean, there's a lot of things that I could do personally where I am enjoying time by myself and for myself without anybody else focusing on me. Let me I ask love you. myself. So I just, like myself. A lot of people don't even like themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Do you, um, <laughs> have you gone to your mother and told her you were sorry for resenting her for not protecting you from your father? I don't resent my mother. Did you tell her that? Yes. You told we her. So what? We've had the conversation multiple times. And you told her you were- the point, She thought that I did resent her and I corrected her. I told her that, no, I don't resent her. And, you, uh, and will you be going to your father and letting him know you don't resent him either? I already told him that. You told him you don't, you don't you're not- At angry. his sentencing, at his sentencing, I told him that I forgive him and I don't resent him. Let me, quick answers to these because of time. Um, sure. Do you support abortion? I don't support- I support a woman's right to choose abortion. So do you personally support abortion? For me personally, uh, not. Hmm. Do I personally support abortion? As far as the law of abortion, I support, I support women. So if you take, should the law of preventing a woman from getting an abortion exist? Should Roe v. Wade be overturned? No, I disagree with that. Do you so personally do, do you personally support abortion? Personally, you. For myself? Period. Do you personally support abortion? Abort you. Abortion for myself. Anyone. Do you personally support abortion? If a woman, if for myself, I don't support, I mean, I wouldn't choose abortion for Why myself. Not? Why would you choose it for yourself if you support it for other women? Why not for yourself? I so if a woman decides to have abortion, I'm going to support her. But, but why myself, not? If it's not good for the goose, why is it good for the gander? I don't know anything about the goose and the gander. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a human, not a goose or a gander. <laughs> so if it's not good for you, why is a you why why is it that you personally w do not support abortion? You would never have an abortion, am I right? If I I would not I would not choose abortion. Why not? I because I know me. I know the impacts that it would have on my life, on my psychological standing. Um, I also have children already. And if I was to get pregnant, then I would have to take the fact that it's their brother and, or sister into account. So for me, but I'm also in the position. Well, why would you support something so hard? Why would you support something so horrible for other women when you know the effects of it? You just named some of the effects of it, and you're absolutely right. Why would you uh, support any woman having an abortion knowing those effects will affect her? 
Well, I don't, if I don't know her, I don't know how it would affect her. She could be fine. No, she won't be fine. I'm not going to assume that how a choice affects me is going to be the same way that it's going to, that that it will affect somebody else. But it will. Because, Because let's say, let's say a woman was raped like me by her father like me and that child was found that while she was pregnant has a genetic disorder that will make the child expire not long after it's born like in my situation i gave birth to a child that had genetic defic- genetic issues because um of the close relationship it it highlighted it highlighted a disorder that was in my father's genealogy. So she may be able to handle aborting that child better than she could handle carrying that child to term. Oh, I see what you're saying. That child into the world, oh. dealing with the health defects, dealing with whatever let, guilt. Let me tell you, I understand what you're right. saying now. A whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I, I got she you. Be- be able to handle that, but. I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. What you're saying is that the woman is on such an ego trip that she would rather kill the man child because it's all about her. It's not about the baby. I don't want no defective baby. I'm just going to kill it. Because in the good old days, women would have children that were defective, and they'll uh-huh. let God. They, I, I, I know that in my family. I know women who had children and a baby. That's in your family. And I know there other. There's also plenty of women that took a coat hanger to get that baby out. Right, a selfish woman, right. But um, there are other women who, outside my family, who did the same thing. So I understand now that the woman is on such an ego trip. If the baby ain't what she want, the hell with the life of the baby. I'm going to kill the baby because I don't want no baby. I don't want no defective baby. I don't want no normal baby. I need, I'm all about me, so I'm not going to have this baby. I, I totally agree with you. It's about her ego. You totally agree with me. It's about her ego. Yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> so I don't know what you're agreeing with because oh. I didn't say that. Oh, I but, thought you did when you were saying that. If a woman don't want a defective baby and she doesn't want this, doesn't that sound like what she wants? Is that ego or not? That's ego, right? No, I wasn't talking about what she wanted. I was talking about the psychological impacts that it could have on her. I wasn't talking about what she wanted. Do you think a woman should, give me a quick yes or no. Do you think a woman should have the right to kill the man's baby in the womb? <laughs> the way you put in the words. Um, <laughs> I think... Wow, you you're really tailoring that the wording. That's where that's where you're trying to get me. Um, and because that's the fact of, well, it's not just the man's baby. So I feel like your situate your your question is based on a, a false pretense. It is the man's baby because child, it went for the man, not, there would be no baby. It's the man's and the woman's baby. Well, the be- you're right. The woman keep it in the and oven. And then you have to define to me what you consider a child because let's say now in some states where abortion is illegal, they're saying that after six weeks of gestation. But is it a mass of cells? The or moment is it the, the two connect in the womb, it's a child. It's a baby. But I got to... So if a woman miscarries, does that make her a murderer? No. Okay. And why not? Because she's not in control of that. She's not Mm. making that choice. So no. But if God gave a woman the power, gave humans the right to choose, then how do you apply that? You don't have a right to choose. Yes, God gave us the power of choice. That's what makes us no, unique. No, God has people. never given anyone, man or woman, the power of choice. He's never done that. That's another yeah. ego made up thing. But because okay. of time, we can't get into that. I got to heat up this and put you on the hot seat. Oh, I've not been on the hot seat already? <laughs> 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 so here's what I need. I need you to answer these questions. Questions as quickly as possible. Okay. The hot seat. Did you vote for the Great White Hope? And who is the Great White Hope? No, I'm gonna just say no because he wasn't on my ballot. I have a running war with the media. They are among the most dishonest human beings on earth. 
You like talking dolls? That's Donald Trump, the Great White Hope. Someone sent me this. Okay. Did, did no, you did, did you vote for the Great White Hope? No, I did not. So. Do you, do you love the Great White Hope? Mm, not necessarily. I don't know him enough to direct my energy towards him in that way. Did you um, do you trust the vaccine? No, I trust no vaccines. Uh, is abortion worse than slavery? Is abortion worse than slavery? No. Um, are, are you a team Kanye or a team Kim? Ooh. Um, I don't belong to either one of their teams. Um, do you believe in climate change? Yes. Who it's is, hot now. <laughs> so what now? It's hot now? It's hot now. <laughs> it's 97 degrees where I am. <laughs> Who is more evil, uh, 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 Camilla Harris or uh, Hillary Clinton? More evil? Yeah. Well, I can't, I don't know either one of them well enough to change, but as far as the, what they have presented to the world publicly, um, I would say that Hillary Clinton is leaning more towards the side of evil only because of some research that I've done on her. Is white supremacy real? Yes. Uh, what is a man? What is a man? Yes. When you say man, you mean as far as the gender or sex? Yeah, a man. What is a man? Well, a man, if we're speaking biologically, is a human being that was born with XY chromosomes that grew a penis and usually <laughs> produced more testosterone than their counterpart, which would be a woman. What is a woman? A woman would be the same definition, but instead have an XX chromosome. Um, and has had, I do think life experiences contribute, but definitely going through some of the developmental issues, challenges, and experiences that that human being goes through as a woman that are unique to her. Are you proud and to be an overcome those things? Are you proud to be an American? I am. Does a chicken have lips? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, do you smoke pot? Do I smoke pot? Mm, I have in the past. <laughs> so I like Bill Clinton. Uh, <laughs> should a man, should men and women split the bill? It depends on the relationship. If they're just friends, I can understand splitting the bill. If they are in a romantic relationship, I do believe the man should pay. <laughs> Unless it's a gift from the woman, then you know it's up to them when it comes down to it. <laughs> did you have fun? Yes, I did. Thank you so much for taking on the hot seat and thanks for coming on. I totally appreciate it. Tell the folks how to get to find your work and whatever you're doing to put it out there for them. Sure. So I'm as I am Aziza Kabibi everywhere on Instagram, Aziza Kabibi, Twitter, Aziza Kabibi. My website is Aziza Kibibi, A Z I Z A K I B I B I dot com. My organization is P L L Nonprofit dot org. Um, and yeah, if you just Google me, Google my name or Google the organization's name, Precious Little Ladies Incorporated, you shall find me. My book, Unashamed of Life Tainted, is available on Amazon, um, as well as on my website. You can get signed copies there. And um, there's a lot more to come. I'm working on another book for next year, and I'm working on the script, and you know, there's more to come. Well, I wish you well. And uh, Thank again, thanks for coming on. And thank you folks for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Don't forget to like, follow, ring the bell. Uh, check out the merch. Amazing merch. And the Father's Day is on subscribestar.com. So click the link in the video to support our work. Thank you so much, folks. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Amazing. <laughs>